Good to see everybody today. We have been um, working through a series on wisdom, um, wisdom throughout the scriptures, and looking at Proverbs, looking at the gospel, looking all over the scriptures to see God's wisdom. As we said um, early on in our series, and as we've, we've emphasized throughout, the, the, the Bible talks about wisdom as, as skill, just like the, the craftsmen who are really good, like Aholiab, who's a craftsman to, to construct the tabernacle, and you think about somebody who's so skilled to, to construct and to do art and to do all those things, I'm talking about skill, but not just skill in that specific way, but skill for life and skill for flourishing. I want to say a brief word about flourishing before we get into the lesson, right? Because we, we've talked about this, but when, when the scriptures even talk about flourishing, what's it, what's it talking about? Um, it's more than just a happy life. It's more than just even living the good life now. Sometimes I'll hear that, that, that phrase connected with Proverbs specifically. It can encompass some of those things, but when you look at the, the whole scope of Scripture, we realize, man, there's just some of that good life we're not going to experience right now because of all the, the corruption that's around us, because of all the problems that are still there. I can make so many good decisions, and as Job shows, as Ecclesiastes shows, that good life is still out of, out of grasp. And so when, you, when it talks about flourishing, it's talking about something deeper than just simply controlling our circumstances in the way we would want them right now. It's about, it's about living in tune with the Creator Himself, being tapped into, his, into, the, into Him um, and into His purpose, into the way He's working in the world and the way He's bringing about history. It's being tapped into His kingdom, which is a cruciform kingdom, right? And so we recognize, okay, wisdom, this skill for flourishing, there's this now dimension to it, but there's also this not yet dimension to it. Just as we, just as we experience God's kingdom to some extent now, there's a not yet aspect of it as well. And so we, 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 that's why Jesus said, flourishing are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Say, flourishing are those who are meek or gentle, for they shall inherit the earth, right? Notice that there's a present reality, but there's also that future hope, and, and it's all of that that we're trying to tap into in this wisdom series, this, this skill for life in God. Um, and so I, I've been focusing on, on um, wisdom for relationships the last few weeks, and the same is true, right? T to some extent, if we just apply these principles, more or less our, our relationships will go well, but sometimes, despite all I bring to the table, the other person or the other people in that relationship don't reciprocate. Like Paul says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. We recognize there are limits to what we can control in those relationships, but yet realizing that these principles that we're talking about is about serving something better than just simply a happy marriage or a happy family or happy neighborhood or those kinds of things. But again, it's, it's about getting in touch with, tapping into, sharing in this bigger thing that God is doing in the world, in His kingdom. And so as we follow Messiah crucified and walk by the Spirit, what's happening then is, is that, that work is happening in us, right? That, that, that fruit of the Spirit is bearing in us love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and all these things. And then that transforms our relationships, but it's sharing in this bigger thing that God's doing in the world. Okay. Set that little intro one aside. But let's, get, let's, talk, let's continue then talking about wisdom for relationships. So if you think about what, what I've said the last few weeks, that, that what we see and what God has done through Messiah crucified, that's providing both the pattern and the power for our reconciliation and for our healthy relationships. Um, we looked last time at Philippians 2 in particular, what, what I called the heart of healthy relationships. And there we saw that, that for, for that to, to be, for, for relationships to be fully all that they can be in the Lord, that it's, it's no pride and selfishness, it's only humility and love, it's, it's, it's thinking and caring about the other person before ourselves, um, caring more about the other person, caring more about the relationship than the issues himself that we tend to fight and, and struggle over. Um, today, I'd like to keep building on that foundation, and, and, and make no mistake about it, that is the foundation that we're going to build on. 
but, but uh, as we build on that, I want to start talking about reconciliation a little bit more specifically, okay? So talking about the, the process of reconciliation. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into our text for this morning. Father, thank you for your grace and your kindness, your mercy and your compassion and your patience towards us. Thank you for the wisdom that you provided through your spirit in the scriptures, in the gospel. Help us to um, avail ourselves to that wisdom and to seek that wisdom and to fill up on that wisdom and to be changed by it, that we can honor you, that we can no fullness of life in you, that we can, can live that, that fullness and flourishing that you've created us for. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you would, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> We're in the Sermon on the Mount, certainly one of the most important passages in our scriptures for giving us just a, a a, a vision of what it means to be God's people, and particularly what it means to be God's people in light of this, this what God's doing in his kingdom. Um, I, I won't say, say a lot about context, I'll just get into it, but if you, if you look at beginning in verse 23, look at verse 23, in 21 through 22, he he's, begins to call us towards this, this um, fuller way of life, right? Not, not just simply looking at our external behaviors, or, or, or thinking about just sort of shallow, superficial uh, response to the scriptures. Um, you know, he said, you've heard it say you shall not murder. Well, duh, okay, yeah, li- don't literally kill people, but Jesus says it's deeper than that. It, 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 the anger that's in our hearts matters. The words, the destructive words that we say matters as well, okay? And so with that, he goes on to say, beginning in verse 23, Therefore, if you're presenting your, your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar, and go first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Okay? Think about the scene that he's just described, right? Okay, so, so here's a faithful Jew who's brought their offering to the altar, the temple in Jerusalem for their, for their offering. And let's say, uh, for sake of argument, it's not an ox. It's not as, it, but let's just say they brought a, a sheep or goat or something like that to the, to the offering. Okay, they've got their, got their offering. They're there. They're ready to, to share in the sacrifice. And, 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 and the process of offering this to God, they think about all that God has done for them, all that God's given him, the mercy and the forgiveness and the compassion, all the things he's given them, and their heart stirred up to remember this wrong that they have between another brother or sister, right? There they remember that this brother has something against you. Notice what he says to do. Leave your offering at the altar. Be reconciled. Then come back and bring your offering. Think about that for just a second. The, the inconvenience of that and, and, and how that grinds against our instinct and our nature. Let's say this person, right, has, has traveled from Galilee, has, has made the multi-day walk, they brought their offering, and, and there they are, they're ready, and the, the brother with the problem is still back in Galilee, right? Think about what he's saying to do. Or let's say, maybe for sake of argument, the brother's with them in Jerusalem, he just has to leave the temple area and go to another, but, but regardless, right, that is, that is so inconvenient and, and challenging, but notice what he's saying here. Leave the offering. Why, why would he say that? Why would he say that? What's, what's that? what's that suggest about reconciliation? This passage is teaching us something about the priority of reconciliation and wholeness in relationships. The urgency of reconciliation and pursuing wholeness in relationships, right? We could say it this way. Jesus teaches us that reconciliation is more important than fill in the blank. More important than sacrifice, more important than ritual, more important than going to church, more important than acts of worship. Do we see this? What would what would sort of a modern rendition of this be? If Jesus were talking to us today on this side of the cross, how would he phrase this? Wouldn't he wouldn't use temple sacrifice language? 
If you're partaking of the Lord's Supper and there remember that your brother has something against you, get up and leave the auditorium and be reconciled to your brother and then come back and eat the Lord's Supper. And can you see the same kinds of parallels? Right, right when, we're, when we're sharing in the, the body and blood of the Lord, right? What are, we, what are we bringing to mind? All that God's done for us, all that he's given us. And can you, you see how that should stir us up to remember those relationships, right? But notice again the, 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 the urgency, the priority of reconciliation. Um, too often, this is not the way we respond to, to problems in our relationships, is it? Too often, our problems just get swept under the rug without any real reconciliation, without actually addressing the problem. And, and, and I mean, that, that is definitely the easy thing to do, right? It's some, some problem arises, there's been a blow-up, and, and, and rather than actually address the thing itself, just, you know, let a little time pass, move on, and, and just ignore it, right? Sweep problems under the rug. But when you think about, think about it this way, have you, have you guys ever seen like a tree that's, that's like rotted from the inside out? You know, some, sometimes you get like a tree that needs to be cut down, um, you're concerned about it, you cut it down, you open it up, and you look, think like, this thing would have fallen on the house if we, you know, if it, you know it's, it's this kind of thing. You, you look at the tree, and it's standing, and, and unless you're like really just no trees or whatever, you think, you know, it's a strong tree, it looks good, the, there's, there's leaves on it, it's fine, but then the storm blows over, and like, oh, this thing was dead on the inside, right? It had rotten from the inside. That's what happens in our relationships when we don't reconcile, when we don't pursue reconciliation, we just sweep stuff under the rug. Those, those problems pile up, the issues pile up, the bitterness and the resentment goes deeper, the blow-ups get bigger and bigger, and, and you, what you may have on the outside is, is some form of a relationship. I mean, you know, most look, you know, onlookers would say, yeah, like, look, they're there's this big tree, they're, they're doing just fine, but inside it's dead. Even if you don't get to the point where it splits like this, inside it's dead. And yet Jesus is saying, reconcile quickly, pursue reconciliation with urgency, right? Prioritize reconciliation. First, leave, you know, be reconciled, leave your offering, leave the Lord's Supper, leave whatever else you, you think is important right now, be reconciled to your brother or sister or husband and wife or parent or child, and then come back and do whatever else you're doing. Jesus goes on to more or less make the exact same point in the next few verses. Look at 25 through 26. He says, Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into the prison. Truly I say to you, you'll not come out of there until you've paid the last cent. We recognize the just obvious wisdom in this. It's, it's much better to settle outside of court <laughs> You know, if you, can, if you can settle and work it out before you get to the judge and have to face the full penalty of, of law, and be sentenced by him, you want to do that. Likewise, it's a lot better that we reconcile than stand before God someday not having been reconciled. I think that's really the point Jesus is getting to with this little parable. So again, the, the priority of reconciliation, the urgency of reconciliation, first be reconciled. Make friends quickly, right? He's, he's stirring us up to prioritize these things. But let's go on to Ephesians 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 26. Another section like the Sermon on the Mount that just gives us a, 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 a wide-angle view, a, a sort of all-encompassing view of what it means to be the people of God and how we're to live. And he's describing in this particular context... How, what this transformation in Christ looks like, this putting off this old way of life, being renewed from within, and putting on this new way of life, right? Uh, and, and so he's, he's walking through and helping us see this in, in various aspects of life, putting aside falsehood, speaking truth. But look at what he says in verse 26. He says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Think about the first part here. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. For the first thing we have to, we have to re recognize here is, is the, the, the role of anger or, or not. Is, is anger in and of itself sinful? We, we may think 
yes, but, but stop and think about it. So often in Scripture, it's God who is being described as angry. Mark 3, you talk about Jesus angered and grieved at their hardness of heart, or grieved and angered at their hardness of heart. So, so, so we recognize, okay, anger in itself is not sinful. Anger has a place. Um, so we'd say anger is not sinful, um, but we would say for us, anger is not sinful, but it's dangerous, right? Because we're so prone to pride and selfishness that our anger so often is expressed in sinful ways. But, but the key is how do we respond in our anger, right? There's a couple, uh, at least a, 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 a couple ways to respond to anger in wrong ways. The obvious is the blow up, right? We think about somebody who's just blowing up, flying off the handle. They, 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 they are, you know, raising their voice, saying harmful things with their words, throwing, throwing stuff, hitting stuff, you know, that, that sort of blow up. We recognize, okay, that's, that's not God's response to anger. That's not godly anger. Um, the other side of that, though, that sort of not blowing up but clamming up and sort of turning inward, and, and when we do that, that's where bitterness and resentment grows, and those tap roots of bitterness and, and resentment go deep. So do we, do we blow up? Do we clam up? Or do we address the problem God's way, right? Do we respond to the, whatever the, the source of the anger, the, the provocation for the anger, do we respond to that God's way with gentleness and patience and mercy? Another way to think about it is, our, is our anger constructive or destructive, right? The blow up, right, that's destructive. That's not, that's not helping anybody. That's not, you know, you often harm others with the things that we say or the, the, the physicality, the violence of, of the anger. Um, so, so people are hurt, relationships are hurt, things are, are destroyed in, in our anger. So we recognize the, destruction, the destructiveness of that. But think also about that bitterness, right? The destructiveness of bitterness. That, that rather than the, just the quick, obvious destruction, that's the slow death. That's the poisoning ourselves from within where that bitterness takes root in our heart. And all that does is poison us. Right? We, we, we grow more and more soured, more and more bitter. Um, and then it starts to affect relationships as well. Um, and so it, it, is, it, is, is our anger destructive or constructive? Um, we, we recognize anger doesn't age well. Right? You, you think about all sorts of things, you know, wines and cheeses and all those, those things age well uh, to a point. Anger doesn't do that. It gets worse and worse and more sour and more rancid and rot. God would have us be constructive. If, if, there's a, if there's a legit thing that's wrong, that's, that's causing anger or provoking anger, respond in constructive ways. Right? Rest, rest, uh, respond in constructive ways. Attacking the person is not constructive. Ignoring the problem is not constructive. So how do we handle our anger in constructive ways? That, that thing that, that happens that's wrong, that, that, that's wrong that's been done. One thing, if, if you know, take whatever scenario that, that's led you to anger, you, you look at it and it's like, is there any real reason? <laughs> is, there, is there a good reason to be angry about this? And if not, that we just need to let go. We, we recognize those times. We, we, we sort of maybe in, in, instinctually get angry about something, but then we, I have, there's no reason to get upset about this. Whatever it is, you, we know those situations. Th- those things, we just need to let go. And we may need to be praying about that to, to help, for God to help us let it go. Um, but, then, but then, no, here's actually a legitimate problem. So what do, what do we do in that, right? Um, we need to address the problem itself and work on it, which means open and honest communication, right? I've got to be communicating with, with someone else. Again, with patience, with gentleness, with kindness, with a spirit of grace and a spirit of mercy. So I'll illustrate this again with Chelsea and I. I did that, that last time, and I'll do it again. So let's, you know, this is all hypothetical stuff, of course, so I had to think a while to imagine a scene that might happen. Of course, you know, none, none of this ever happens, but... Um, so, so imagine a, a scenario where, where I've, I've asked Chelsea to help me with something, right? You know, I've, I've got to be gone all day, and um, could you just do this one thing to help me out so that we can do this, this, and this? And I come home, and, you know, the, the, the one thing I just, I'd asked help for didn't get done, okay? So how do I respond? Okay, there's, there's something that's like, ah, well, yelling and what? Is that, like, is that helping? Yelling and shouting and 
you know, saying harmful things, you know, you idiot. <laughs> would, that, would that help anything? I, I ask you to do one thing, and you can't do the one thing. Right? Can we hear ourselves saying those kinds of things? Right? Does that help? Is that constructive? Is that uh, fixing anything, solving anything? It's attacking her. It doesn't, the problems aside, now it's me against her, right? I'm attacking her, I'm going after her. It's not godly at all, right? That's, that's the blow up. And we can imagine a whole range of reactions that would fall under that thing we might call blow up. But think about the clam up as well, that, that, that thing, okay, I, I come home, I see it, I know it's not been done. And then that's the like mutter under your breath. I'm not going to blow up on this, but I'm just... And then, you know, you take it in and you're just the thoughts going through your head. You get mad at somebody and just... Man, they never could care less about me, you know? She's doing all this stuff. You know, you think about all those things that we, we go through in our heads, right? And that's the claim of, is that, is that constructive? Helping anyone? It, what it's doing, again, is poisoning me inside with bitterness... And it's poison in relationship because then how am I responding to her in other interactions, right? With that coldness, with that distance, with those walls being put up, right? And there's, there's again, if you picture that tree rot, something's happening that's killing the relationship, right? You can see how that, that goes on time and time again. It's destructive, okay? Well, here's another scenario. We'll call it the sort of noble clamming up, right? So, so I come in and I know like, okay, all right. She's had other things going on. She's, you know, kids. So, so I think through in my head, like, why it didn't get done. I'm still not addressing, I'm not talking about it, I'm not communicating, but I'm just trying to, like, all right, I'll, I'll take this. And I'll, I'll, you know, but I don't actually process the anger. I just absorb it, <laughs> you know. And, and rather than praying about it and asking God, okay, something like, Father, forgive her, for she, she didn't mean that. You know, and just, just, you know, working through that way, I'm, I'm clamming up, but I, I do it with this sort of air of nobility of like, I'm, I'm going to not hold this against her, but what ends up happening is I end up still holding it against her anyway. Versus what would <laughs> pursue reconciliation, prioritize reconciliation with urgency, with priority, right? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it quickly, right? So what, is that, what does that look like? Again, I, I don't do that with the blow-up. I don't do it with the claim-up. I'm, I'm addressing it, but I'm doing it with the way, the way of the Spirit, with love and with joy and with peace and with patience and with kindness and with goodness and with faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, mercy, grace, all these things that I'm learning from God to then arm me and equip me to engage in this issue, right? And so, hey, Chelsea, I've really needed this thing done. You know, and you can just elaborate the story or whatever, right? Um, but, but again, how I, how I go, I'm not, I'm not attacking her. I'm not, I'm not wanting to destroy her. I'm not wanting to, like, build up this wall in a relationship. But there, there is an issue. There's a problem that's been done. And we need to, we need to work now to fix this, this wrong that's been done, right? You, you, see, you see what I'm saying? You guys have probably heard this expression in connection with these verses. Don't go to bed angry. That especially applies in marriage, right? You don't maybe think about that with brother-sister relationships in churches, right? Don't go to bed angry. But in marriage, you hear that all the time. Don't go to bed angry. Has everybody heard that, that wise saying? That's, Paul's saying more than that here, but I'll tell you, at least thinking about this in terms of married relationships, if you do this, that's a pretty faithful application of what Paul's saying here. A lot of wisdom in, in not going to bed angry, not allowing that, that conflict, that riff, uh, to just grow and, and, and get bigger and bigger and bigger in the, in the relationship. Um, and as I said last week, it doesn't mean you have to resolve every nuance of the issue itself, but we can humble ourselves, can't we? We can, we can recognize our own selfishness that caused the blow-up or the conflict, and we can restore the relationship and then we can, we can move forward from there. Paul's point is deal with anger soon, resolve conflict soon. Notice what else he goes on to say, and do not give the accuser an opportunity. He adds an important, important warning here in this as well. If we don't deal with anger constructively 
and soon will give the accuser an opportunity to wreak havoc and destroy. Again, blowing up and clamming up. We already discussed that, that damage, that potential for, for damage and destruction. But think about it this way, the, the control of our hearts as well. So not just, not just what it's doing from either blowing up or clamming up, but think about, think about even our hearts in this. If, if there's bitterness in my heart, who's ruling within me? Right? It's not God. Right? If, if, if bitterness is, is growing in me and characterizing me and affecting, God's not ruling. So, so now I've given the accuser control over my, my heart. Another, another way he'll wreak havoc and destroy is more and more conflict. If I don't resolve conflict, problems pile up higher and higher. Resentment builds, bitterness builds, conflicts become more frequent and more intense. Um, again, you, you think about if, if I've not dealt with this issue and all I do is just sort of set it aside, sweep it under the rug, whatever, every other conflict, every other t- what am I doing? I'm carrying this issue to that one. And then I carry this issue to that one. And, and what you end up with is years and years and years and years of unresolved conflict and issues with one another, right? And, and again, it's, it's destructive. It's like that tree that's rotted on the inside. It just takes, finally, the last thing, the wind blows it and it splits, right? And so then you see as well, he'll, he'll lead us to break down in division, partnerships sever, friendships devolve, but dissolve, marriages end in divorce, family members are estranged, neighbors feud, churches split, nations go to war, right? These are the things that happen when we fail to handle anger God's way. When we fail to, to, to um, handle anger in constructive ways, when we f- fail to resolve conflict, when we feel to reconcile quickly with urgency, with priority, these are the things that happen when we give the accuser an opportunity. But in sharp contrast, when I reconcile with someone, whether it's my wife, whether it's my kids, whether it's a brother or sister in Christ, um, when when I reconcile with that person, I've prioritized that and I've done that quickly, you know what happens? The relationship is restored. And we we go on living and growing closer together. And and most often... If I've actually worked through it with somebody, I'm closer to them on this side because we've really been honest with one another. We've really been open with one another. And so now I come to the next conflict, and not only am I free of all the baggage that I had, would have had, I'm also, we're a lot more equipped to work through it together because we have this, this groundwork of honesty and openness and humility with one another. You could see how, again, the, the conflicts, instead of, in, instead of like destroying and eroding the marriage or, or relationship, you just get stronger and stronger and closer and closer. And as we saw last time, if I'm really following Messiah crucified in humility and in love, the issues, the disagreements come up, but, but those things can hit us without ever hurting the relationship. They just bounce off the relationship. The relationship's solid and intact. So be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with stuff quickly. Resolve conflict quickly. And do not give that devil an opportunity. I want to think about this as well. So as we said, the gospel is the pattern and the power. Think about it this way. Everything we've talked about, prioritizing reconciliation, making an urgent reconciliation, making sure to do it quickly, this is my responsibility. And each one of you would say the same thing. I didn't want to say, this is your responsibility, right? But each one of us should, should personalize this. This is my responsibility. Right? This is my responsibility. Don't wait for the other person. You go to them. You initiate. You start the communication process. You be the first to admit you were wrong, the first to admit your pride or selfishness, you let, uh, um, the first to, to let the other person know if they've, if they've wronged you. Don't go to somebody else and say, can you believe all this person did or said or what? No, go to them directly. Notice that there's a, there's a really interesting picture that's painted in Matthew with a, with a couple blocks of teaching in Jesus. In Matthew 5, where we just read, notice what it said, if your brother has something against you, you go, right? Th- think about that for just a second. It's, it, it, it's not that that person did something to you, but, but they've got something against you, right? Whether you've done anything wrong or they just think you've done They've got something against you, and notice whose responsibility is it to go. It's mine. 
right? They've got something against me, I go, right? In, in Matthew 18, though, he says, if your brother sins, and some manuscripts say against you, go, right? So, so think about this scene for a second. Whether I'm the one who, who, who has done the wrong, or at least thinks to have been done the wrong, um, I go, or whether I'm, uh, someone else has done the wrong, I go. Now, the ideal scenario is you've got two Jesus followers, and both of them meet in the middle because they're faithful to what the Lord's saying, right? They recognize the issue, they recognize the conflict, they recognize the rift in the relationship, and, and one has something against you, and they go. The other person knows someone has something against and there we've met in the middle with humility, with love, ready to restore, and ready to move forward. And all of this is exactly what God's done for us, right? He made the first move. He's the one who initiated. He pursued reconcili- reconciliation with us. He didn't wait for us to repent or turn our life around or even say we're sorry. Romans says, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. Right? He did all the work of reconciliation while we were in the wrong and then simply calls us to respond to his love. That's what the gospel teaches us. And that same gospel that's given us so much ground and so much opportunity then says, man, let that seed grow in your heart, germinate in your heart, start to take root and start to grow up and start to bear fruit in your life so that you can do the same thing in your relationships. You're not growing bitter. You're not blowing up. You're not waiting on the other person to come to you. But you, with humility and love, go to the, the person, right? Because as we said last time, the, 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 the relationship is more important. The person is more important than the issues. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, thank you for all the love and grace you've given us in Jesus. For loving us in our selfishness and our pride and our idolatry and all the mean things we say and do to other people. All the ways that we've rejected you and and, um, been unfaithful. And you continue to pour out grace on us. You continue to pour out love on us. Your forgiveness is infinite. Your mercy is so, so great. You've cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You promise to remember them no more. And we're so thankful for the forgiveness that we have, the reconciliation that we have. Father, help us all to put on Um, the same spirit to let this gospel grow up in us to transform all of our relationships to be um, more full of of mercy towards one another grace towards one another humility and love um, caring about others more um, not being so bent on the the Things, the, the wrongs and the injuries and the, the ways we're slighted and <clears throat> the, the ways we're hurt, but uh, being able to have gain strength from your spirit, knowing uh, and resting in all that we have and the great hope that we have in Jesus. Help us all, Lord. And in Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> If you're here this morning and you need our prayers for anything, um, any encouragement, any, any comfort, any, anything we can do to, to pray with you and for you, we'd love to do that. And if you're not in Christ, uh, we would urge you to give your life to him. Let that old self that's so full of pride and selfishness that we all recognize too often, let that die um, and, and, and raise to live a new life in Jesus. Um, I urge you to, to receive his grace and receive his love and, and serve him. If there's anything we can do for you, please come forward as we stand and sing.